The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified, and on the third day rise again? Then they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please bow with me in prayer. Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Well, once again, happy Easter. It's a blessing to have all of you here today. And I know some of you are visitors, and if you're a visitor, I'd like to catch you up with what we've been doing during Lent as we've led up to this Easter Sunday. We've been doing a series entitled Transitions, and if you were a member of St. Luke's, you would understand why we're talking about that. But uh, thus far, what we've talked about during the season of Lent is we've talked about four Old Testament figures, Abraham and Moses and David and Isaiah. And we talked about the different transitions that they went through in their lives as they grew to trust in the Lord and come to know the Lord ever deeper in their faith. And then we jumped to the New Testament and we talked about Peter and we talked about John. So we talked about those two apostles. And now on Easter Sunday, it makes the most sense to talk about Jesus, you would think. And the transition that we're talking about today is a little different than the transition with the other biblical figures that we've talked about because Jesus, unlike the others, had no sin. You know, if you think about the life of Abraham and Moses and, and all the rest that I mentioned, they all had sin in their lives. Sin in their lives that they had to deal with, sin in their life that God would take them and because of their response to him, would change them, transform them. And that God would then not only grow his relationship with them, but then he would use them in tremendous and wonderful ways. Jesus was different. Because Jesus was always perfect. So there was no sin in his life. He never made bad decisions. We all make bad decisions. And we all have struggles in our lives because we're not perfect. You know, some of you know this because you've heard through the grapevine, but on Monday I was privileged and gifted again to play in the Pro-Am. And um, I've been an alternate for several years now, and I played with a wonderful guy, Richie Warinsky. And um, when I got called up, I was so excited. That's what happens. I get really excited. And I'm like a little kid. And my son Aaron was caddying for me. That was fun, having him do that. And um, so we hit to the first hole, and I got a bogey. We started off on number 10, which isn't bad for 10, if you know the course. Then I got a par, highly unlikely. And then I got another par, but I shot a 91. <laughs> and see, the reality is, is that Life and the transitions that we go through in life, it's like a roller coaster ride. 
We all have ups and downs. We all have blessings and we all have challenges. And part of the reason is because of our own fallibility and also because of others that sin and cause us pain. We make bad decisions because we don't have total, complete foresight or insight. Well, Jesus wasn't like that. Jesus was perfect. And he knew all along the way that he would follow his Father's will perfectly. But that doesn't mean that he didn't go through transitions of his own and struggles of his own. Both because of the world in which we all live, which is a fallen world, but also because of the sin in other people's lives. And just the fact that he went through the changes that he went through. You know, what Jesus went through, unlike the rest of us, is that when Jesus came, when Jesus was born, he became downwardly mobile. See, most of us are seeking to be upwardly mobile in all ways. We're seeking to get better jobs, better paying jobs, more recognition, more privilege. We want to progress upward. We want better places to live and better vehicles to drive. We're going after prestige and impressing people or at least some of us are. And if you were to watch television, what you would basically be told is that you always deserve more. You always deserve better. And you're constantly climbing the ladder. And sometimes it leaves other people behind. And it can be such a trap. Jesus, on the other hand, modeled something completely different because if you think about what Jesus experienced... He lived in perfect community, perfect unity. He lived in perfect love, perfect peace. And then he was born to this world. He was born of a poor virgin. He was born in a stable. He chose to live with his family in such a way that he was with his family. He was a carpenter, a carpenter's son. He lived in obscurity until he began his public ministry. And when he began his public ministry, he didn't just ascend, but rather he chose to serve. He chose to, out, chose to hang out with the dregs of society sometimes. He chose to touch the untouchable people. He chose differently than most people do in our world. And then beyond that, because of his deep love of the Father, wanting to obey him and do everything he called him to do, he would face rejection and persecution, torture and death. His love for the Father and his love for us is what brought him to that point. And so instead of this upward travel, he became lower and lower to the point that he took sin upon himself, our sin the lowest point he ever hit. He chose to die for us. Which is an amazing thing that he did. This one who lived perfectly, who lived and experienced the perfect life. He knew, by the way, what is in us. In John's Gospel, it says he knew what was in people. He knew the kind of help that they needed. Why? He faced every temptation that we face. He had to live the earthly struggles outside of sin and bad decisions that we live. He had to walk with the apostles in such a way that he was dealing with their constant falling backward, which is what he does with us and for us. He chose to go to the cross for you and for me out of love. And that's why he reached his lowest point. But why? He reached his lowest point so that we could become upwardly mobile God's way. God's way. Not our way. Not the way of the world. God's way. So that we would learn the depth of God's love in our lives as we begin to walk with him and trust him, live for him, and live self-sacrificial love as he modeled. 
You know, Jesus would say several times that God would glorify him, his Father would glorify him, that he would glorify the Father. And when he spoke of that moment that he was bringing God the glory and he would be glorified, it wasn't just the resurrection, it was the cross and the resurrection together. One moment in time where he would bring salvation. When he would defeat the power of sin and death on the cross and then rise again to show that he has power over sin and death. That he has power over any challenge that we face in our lives. And he did so, and this is the critical part, out of love. You know, one Christian singer said, it's not the nails that kept him on the cross, it was his love that kept him on the cross. So that he could bring that embrace to us. So that he could bring that message of, there is salvation. There is transformation. That the God who formed you, the God who made you, can reform you and transform you by his grace and by his power if we let him. You know, there's two psalms that come to mind as we think about what God is doing with us and in us and is wanting to do through us. One psalm that comes to mind is Psalm 8, where David says, we are made a little lower than the angels. Do you realize that? A little lower than the angels. The blessing of that gift, the way God created each of us, some of you might be saying, well, you don't know so-and-so. But the reality is God created all of us a little lower than the angels. And then David goes on to say, because he recognized his own fallibility, his own sinfulness, and I'm a worm and no man. Because he experienced that depth of brokenness and then transformation. That God took him and changed him. One who is called a man after God's own heart. And then he writes in Psalm 139 that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. What a great line. That we are fearfully and wonderfully made. That that's how much God loves you and values you and recognizes that we, all of us, need that Savior and need someone to take our lives and mold them and shape them. And so he wants to be our Lord by the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. You know, about 10 years ago, and he was actually here for a few years before that, he used to volunteer with our youth group, there was a guy by the name of Eric. Eric was a great guy. Eric was a big guy. He played line from the University of Maryland, went on to become a policeman, a SWAT team member, a detective, and he was close to our kids. He was a blessing to our kids. He volunteered with the youth group and he was close to our kids. I eventually would perform his marriage to Michelle and they eventually would have two kids, Bryn and Jack. Well, Eric hurt his ankle when he played college football and then when he was on the SWAT team, he, they were chasing someone and he hurt his ankle even more and he tried to function and he couldn't function and they said, you have to have ankle surgery, which is very delicate if you know anything about joint surgeries. And so he had the ankle surgery, and they moved out to Bluffton. Um, and so I, I decided I'm going to go out and visit Eric because he's been so special to my family because I was really praying that his ankle would, the surgery would work and he would be healed. So I went out to visit Eric, and their three-year-old son, I think he was about three, Jack, answers the door. And Jack looks up, and he's staring at me. So... I went in, I sat and visited with the family. It was a wonderful visit. They had two dogs. I mean, it was just a really, really pleasant time because I just loved that family. And um, Jack kept staring at me the whole time. And so Eric turned to him and said, Jack, do you know who this is? And he went, it's God. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> Through the eyes of innocent children. I didn't even have my white robe on. But it was really, we all got a big laugh, much like you did. We got a big laugh out of that. But I thought about it later. Think about what Jack experienced. 
He has this image in his mind, this hope, this prayer. And in his mind, God visited him. You know, the reality is that God has visited this world. And he visits all of us if we let him. But he wants to do more than just visit. He wants to dwell with us. That's what Jesus said. That's what Jesus prayed. That I will make my dwelling with you. I will abide with you. See, so many of us just want God to visit us. When we want him, when we need him, we just want God to visit us and then leave so that we can live our lives the way we want. Where God wants to dwell with us, to live with us, that his love would change us. So much so that we are changed more and more into that image of which we were first created to be, the image of God. That we're changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. We talk about being Christian, Christ-like, to become more and more like him. That's what he wants to do in our lives. He didn't just come to be a model. He came to be a savior. To save us from our sin. To save us from bad decisions. To save us from ourselves. To save us from the pain and suffering and struggling that's in this world. And there's a lot of it going on right now. Just think about what's going on in the Ukraine, for an example. He came to save us. To dwell with us. To transform us to be like him until we see God face to face and what he will see through his son is the righteousness of Jesus. He will see us as if we are Jesus and we will come, become heirs with him, fellow heirs with Christ. That Jesus was glorified through the cross and the resurrection and we become part of that glory as we go through this world growing in that relationship with him until we're with him for all eternity. That's the promise of the cross and the resurrection together. That's how he wants to change us and dwell with us. What the apostles experienced, we can experience. This Easter, my prayer for you is that you would come to a deeper understanding of the Savior who died on the cross, of the Lord Jesus who rose again, of the power of the Holy Spirit to bring his presence to you constantly, every day, and to be changed and become more and more like him, that we will be blessed and we will bless other people no matter what challenges we have and they have and bring the love that he showed on the cross. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. That he came to this world, visited this world, so that we might come to more of an understanding of who you are. More of an understanding of the depth of your love and grace. More of an understanding of what he needed to do while we were weak, while we were sinners, while we were still enemies, Christ died for us. Lord, we pray that by the power of the cross and the power of the resurrection and the power of the Holy Spirit, you would change us. That you would take our forms, these lives, reform them and transform them so that we might become more and more like Jesus that we might become more and more an image, a vessel of that sacrificial love for the sake of others. 
until we share his glory with you. The gift of the power of the resurrection. Lord, I pray for those here right now that have never made that step, that they would come to you, be transformed by you, and come to know you in an ever-deepening way. And Lord, for all of us, help us to truly experience what the gift of Easter is, the power of the resurrection, the power to change, the power to love as you love. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.